Um, I have Rob Seeley, I'm the president of a, a consulting company called E3 Merge, which stands for Energy, Environment, Economy, I'm trying to get all three of those parts to work together. <clears throat> I'm a 25 year plus uh, with Shell Canada person, and in that uh, stint of time with Shell Canada, <clears throat> I have the opportunity to lead a project called Quest, Carbon Capture and Storage, and which I did for about five years. And uh, we, we essentially had a concept. Unknown to participant is now exiting. Carbon capture and storage in Edmonton, Alberta. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that project that we, we ended up building over there in Edmonton and capturing uh, more than a million tons per year of CO2 and sequestering it deep into sedimentary rock. Okay, let's flip on to the next slide, uh, Shanda, see what comes up here. Uh, right, why do we need this CCS? I think it all starts with, uh, I mean, there's, I think what the, where it's stated most recently is in the IPCC 1.5 degree report where they talk about limiting the limit to 1.5, you need to cut emissions by 45%, and then it says to really get there, we need to reach net zero by 2050. And I think this net zero concept, which has been, um, we've been talking about now, so yesterday and even uh, in December, is uh, interesting because it doesn't mean just reducing your emissions. At some point you can't reduce all your emissions, so you actually have to be doing something else with emissions and putting, if, if there's still some out there that are being emitted to the atmosphere, then we need to be putting, we need to be absorbing CO2 out of the atmosphere and taking it out of the atmosphere. So that's the other concept that comes in with net zero. And they're, they got at this in the IPCC report, they talked about it limiting uh, to 1.5, unprecedented scale, deep emission cuts in all sectors, we'll talk about that, a range of technologies, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the box below, the second point, uh, progress and renewables need to be mirrored. So progress needs, renewables need to lead the way, but we need to start doing other things, and that's the second bullet. We need to start taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And how do we do that? And then in this IPCC report, you'll see that little chart. And there's four scenarios that are basically summarized. There's a hundred, they ran 120 different model scenarios. And I think when, um, uh, was it Chris presented yesterday? Um, you can see all those different lines on the chart, the 120 different scenarios, but they group them into four. And in this chart, you see gray, which is essentially the emissions, and you can see that we're trying to reduce those emissions over time, And but you can see that we can't quite get to zero, but there's still going to be some left. There's still a tail, because there's just some things we can't do with zero and um, carbon energy. And then on the other side, if we're going to get to the level of CO2 we want in the atmosphere, we actually have to start doing other things. And the brown is what we call uh, afforestation and land use. And so that's really about how we manage our forests. Instead of our forests being a, a net a source of emissions because of the way we're managing them, even though they're still absorbing carbon and emitting carbon, maybe the way we're managing, they're still emitting more than they're absorbing. We need to get those forests to be a net absorber. We need to be doing better things with the forests. Unknown participant is now exiting. So that they become a net uh, sequestration of carbon. That's the brown band. And then the yellow band is carbon capture and storage. And that's about using that technology to reduce our emissions and even to produce negative emissions. And we're going to talk about a specific type of technology bioenergy carbon capture storage, which is actually a negative carbon energy. Um, so then that all comes to a head in that little box. It's carbon capture and storage will play a vital role. That's what came out in the IPCC report. We can't do it all by reducing emissions. We have to figure out how do we how to go carbon negative so that we get a net zero. And maybe just before I go to if we go back to that slide, sorry to Shanda on this. In some ways, this little chart could be a microcosm of 
our LNG challenge. So we say, hey, you know, you guys have built a scenario. You've talked about how many emissions there are. And one of the big levers is, is electrification, which would be do, reducing a lot of that gray would come through our electrification. But we still need to do some more stuff to get to net zero. And I think that's the case for our LNG, emerging LNG sector, if we want to aspire to this net zero thing. We're going to need to do other stuff. And we'll see that the sequestration through forest management and CCS become those other levers as well as others, there's other policy tools that come into play, but we're going to need it. So back to this carbon cycle slide, we showed this in December, and basically the slide here is meant to say, on the far left you have the trees, and, and they have their own cycle of emitting carbon through decay and, uh, and, um, and their annual cycles of um, growing and leaves uh, falling off the trees, etc., and then they have their own sink. The other side um, through the respiration and absorbing CO2 from the atmosphere. So they're more or less in balance. And then on the right hand side is the same thing that the oceans are absorbing CO2 and they are emitting CO2. And these engines are very big. And then in the middle, we have our industrial or man made emissions. And it's showing in this arrow 28.1, which is an old number, but it's really an illustrative thing that. We're emitting CO2 from burning our uh, fossil fuels, and um, but we're not doing, and there's a big focus on making that arrow smaller, but we're actually not doing anything like Mother Nature, where it's putting itself in balance by taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it back into the geosphere or the ocean. And that's what CCS is about. It's about if we're going to put this into the atmosphere, we need to have a response to to get it to, to offset our, our man-made activities, not just reduce them. And uh, CCS is, is why that's in the, in, the, in the IPCC report. Okay, so what is CCS? Um, this is a cartoon um, showing a very simplified version of what it is, but on the left is the trees, are the trees growing, which is a form of carbon sequestration. The trees are absorbing CO2 out of the atmosphere through their, uh, their natural um, breathing cycle, um, mitochondrial cycle. And, um, and then on the right, you show, and, and of course they're absorbing CO2 and breathing out oxygen, so they're essentially are the lungs of the earth. And then on the right, we've got our industrial activity where we burn our fossil energy and put it in the atmosphere. And so we need response. We need to try and capture it before it goes into the atmosphere. And then we need to do something with it. And so uh, Alex did mention uh, chemo uh, what we call carbon capture and utilization. And that's where you would convert it into some other product or fuel. Um, you could also then put it into an oil reservoir and actually push out more oil. But at least the CO2 is, is trapped in a cycle. But of course, we're still in, in the business of producing fossil energy that way. And then uh, also we could put it into what's called a deep saline formation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that because often people misunderstand what that is. It's essentially just porous rock. Um, it's, it's rock that has a very microscopic pores. So it's not like you have a big um, saline or a salt cavern, which we do find in uh, Earth's geology. This is really deep and porous rock formations. Often it's deeper than the oil and gas formations that we're using uh, to produce the fossil energy. And maybe one other thing uh, just on that last <coughs> slide is that conversion, the idea of converting CO2 and using it for other purposes is, is good, but it's a bit, it's a bit like the uh, holy grail in that you can convert these things to other um, chemicals or other uses and use them, but over time they um, much of it ends up getting re-emitted to the atmosphere. So it's kind of a, often the CCU type application, carbon capture and utilization is just putting off the inevitable when it's going back in the atmosphere. And a, and a good example is, and a simple example is, well, we're going to capture that CO2, purify it, and use it and put it into soda pop drinks or whatever, or carbonated drinks. All great, but you know we all know that when you pop the top off the drink and drink the drink and 
it fizzes and it comes. So it, it eventually gets back to the atmosphere. Now, some are locked up for much longer. Some applications, you can lock them away for centuries. Uh, others just um, maybe a few years. It depends on what you're using the CO2 for. Whereas if you're putting it into the deep geological formation, say a saline aquifer or a, or a depleted reservoir, um, you're putting it away for good with the intention of putting it away for good. So uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years. Um, so this is basically talking, this little slide just shows the same thing. We're capturing it from industrial sources. This could be a pulp and paper mill. It could be a refinery. It could be a chemical plant. It could be a power plant. Any of these things that are combusting fossil energy um, and or producing CO2 through the uh, chemical processes, such as the gas processing application that Jason talked about, where the gas comes out of the ground, has CO2 in it, instead of just venting that, sending it down the pipe and venting it, we capture it and put it back. So he was just talking about the produced CO2 from a gas, produced gas. And then how deep do you put it? Um, this um, little chart shows roughly 2,000 meters, so that's two kilometers down. And uh, believe me, that is a long way down. And um, often these little cartoons completely get this out of scale. So if you looked at you know the distance between facilities and distance down, it would be way off this chart going down. And uh, and then of course you need a sophisticated monitoring measurement and verification system to go with it. If you're going to put it down there, how do you know it's going to stay down there? How do you know it's going to stay down there for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years? So there's a whole science that goes with that as well as the capture technology. There's the measurement, monitoring, and verification technology. All right, so where can we store this stuff in British Columbia? Well, I think Jason gave you a snapshot and uh, even prior to that, our, um, um, of the northeast uh, British Columbia is the uh, is the sedimentary region in British Columbia. But this map shows a map of um, North America, and it's interesting. The, the the dark gray stuff is the monolithic granite. So this is bedrock, and so you can see it's in the middle. And it's almost like North America was an island at one point with a big crater in the middle of it. And uh, that monolithic rock uh, projects out of the ocean and then the ocean lapped up around it and deposited. And over time, much material was deposited in a sandstone and sedimentary formation. So it's layers and layers and layers of organic material and sands um, that form around that monolithic rock and that gets deeper and deeper as you move away. Uh, that's the light green stuff. So you can see the light green stuff coming right up through Alberta and almost all of Alberta is uh, sedimentary rock and of course southern Saskatchewan and then northeast BC. We just catch the corner of northeast BC which is about maybe one third of our province or quarter has the sedimentary rock and of course that's where all the oil gas and predominantly natural gas and, and oil activity is happening. So those same uh, formations are where we want to put this stuff. Where this fossil energy came from and hydrocarbon came from, we want to put the CO2 back down there. And uh, in fact, in these sedimentary rocks, not only do you find oil and gas, you do find CO2 stored in natural formations already down there. So it's a natural place to put it back. Um, Interestingly enough, if you look on the right, you can see it a little better than the uh, northeast BC, but you'll see there are two other sandstone basins in central BC, in the Chaco Basin and the Bauer Basin. And these are, uh, I would say, relatively unexplored. Um, there's, there are some drilling uh, records from, in, uh, from within the Chaco Basin, but um, I'm not sure there's... Uh, how much uh, opportunity there is, but there, where there is sandstone and sedimentary rock, there is an opportunity for CO2 sequestration. So never say never. Um, but that would be part of, um, you know, part of establishing a hub of CO2 storage in BC. We need to think about what is the right, the best location for the storage, uh, and that's often a starting point. And then if you go way out to Kitimat, 
you can see you're in the green and Prince Rupert, you can see you're in the green. You're, you're not in, in any kind of sedimentary rock out there unless you go offshore. And uh, again, we have a drilling moratorium offshore uh, for oil and gas. And I don't know how that would extend to exploring for CO2 storage sites, but I suspect uh, that would uh, get caught up in, in that policy. But that's a whole other, whole other story. Um, where we do know we have good spots, northeast BC, and, and who knows, maybe the potential in the, in the Chaco Basin, which is more central. Um, this is the what I alluded to that when you put it down, the cartoons are a bit misleading. There are a lot of layers of rock to go down uh, to storage uh, depth, and um, in fact, it's often deeper than the oil and gas. And you'll see that when I talk about the Shell Quest project, we went right to the bottom, all the way to the bottom of these sedimentary layers to bedrock, where you hit the monolithic. Um, and we uh, we put it in the very bottom layer called the basal Cambrian sand, and uh, that's where we're storing the CO two from the project in Edmonton. Uh, so we talked about where where in BC this might have the potential for storage, and uh, the northeast um, sedimentary rock is the most studied. Unknown participant is now exiting. And there was a study by Stefan Batchew et al. He's a, um, a, um, an expert in this area working for, uh, I believe, the Alberta government. Um, but his study studied more than uh, just Alberta. He went into British Columbia as well. And he had pinned for roughly, based on what we call completed gas, oil and gas formations, uh, done calculations to estimate how much storage of CO2 you could put in those regions. And so in the Northeast uh, sedimentary basin based on roughly 80 depleted and or operating um, reservoirs, he had more than 1,900 million tons of storage just on... Unknown participant is now exiting. Depleted gas, oil and gas. He didn't include any estimates for saline aquifers as we use in the Quest project. Uh, he felt they were very difficult to estimate, so he didn't have numbers for them. But my experience says it's probably the equivalent of oil and gas uh, depleted reservoirs. So all that to say, in the Northeast BC, if you had 10 million tons a year of CO2 being captured for some hypothetical scenario, uh, then you have more than uh, you know, 100, 100 years of storage um, you know, on that basis, or almost 200 years of storage on that basis uh, for depleted gas and oil reservoirs only. Next, um, and that was for Northeast BC only, not, a, not including the others. This is a bit of a map of the world that shows where people are starting to think about this and starting to uh, <coughs> quantify the level of storage they think they have within the geology. And uh, you can see that our geology is amenable to storage and similar to all, all of Europe, we're sort of in the same range of storage. Um, the US has even greater storage uh, volumes estimated. and. Um, yeah, Australia is similar to us, and uh, there's a large area in South America, well, large seacoast fishing potential. But it, it, all this to say, there's quite a number of areas where, is now joining. where this, uh, where carbon storage could take, theoretically take place, where the geology is uh, strong for this type of uh, technology. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about this project in Edmonton that was built from 2011 through to uh, 2014, and it started up in 2015. And it captures just a little more than a million tons of CO2 a year. And uh, in preparing this presentation, I had to look back through some of my old ones, and I realized, you know, we did the early studies on this back in 2003. So uh, these things take a long time to get going. And it feels a little bit like we're 
we're behind Alberta on this, but that's not to say we can't catch up. But you know, again, uh, 17 years later, and looking at what could we do in BC feels like uh, we've been standing still for a while on this. Uh, the this particular project was about capturing CO2 from uh, a hydrogen manufacturing unit in an, in an oil sands upgrader. So in the upgrader, where you're cracking the heavy oil, the fish unit comes down from Fort McMurray, uh, from the oil sands plant. Um, it's cracked uh, from heavy oil to light oil by adding hydrogen. But in order to make hydrogen, you're using natural gas. So it's good back to this natural gas story. We use natural gas to make hydrogen, and then we make hydrogen to make heavy oil light oil. And that hydrogen plant, uh, you take a methane molecule and you strip all the hydrogens off of it, it's CH4, strip all those hydrogens off and you're left with a carbon molecule. So you end up making hydrogen and your byproduct is CO2. And most of these facilities in the world just vent the CO2. And so there was going to be roughly 1.2 million tons of CO2 vented. And uh, we felt this is, uh, you know, this is an application for CCS if we can make it work. So uh, essentially, Jason, he uh, alluded to the fact that you need uh, something called an amine unit. It's the conventional technology. It's a solvent. You run the CO2 through a, a vertical column, <coughs> up, and then you have a liquid solvent, <coughs> excuse me, coming down through the column on a series of trays, and it absorbs the CO2. And so, uh, and then the CO2 is stored in the, in the amine, it's regenerated in pure CO2 and compressed. Uh, it's compressed to about 2,000 PSI. And so this project was uh, maybe just use the activated amine. <clears throat> we had three steam methane reformers. We have, you need energy to compress it and you need energy to regenerate it. But um, most of the regeneration energy we got from within the, the system. So we didn't have to use any more burning of gas or anything. The compression is uh, electrical energy. So again, it depends on where that electricity comes from. And uh, so the system we could run without a whole lot of more uh, energy inputs. And so we didn't make a lot more CO2 running this system. People often ask that if you're going to capture CO2 and, and extract it and then compress it and then put it down the ground, aren't you just going to make a whole bunch more energy and use energy and make more CO2. Well, in this case, we actually made very little. So 1.2 million tons of CO2 was captured and probably the net abated is probably around 1.1. So we only used about, we only made about 0.1 million tons per annum of CO2 through all the energy inputs. Uh, it was completed in operational in 2015. And so it's been putting away more than 4 million tons of CO2 since then. Uh, this project needed help, and we're going to get into this. Uh, capital cost $850 million, and so I would say net CO2 abatement cost of roughly $120 per ton. So when we talk about today's world in British Columbia, where we have a $50 per ton carbon tax, <coughs> that's not going to pay for one of these babies. And uh, so how do we get this going? How do we get it? How do we get it going? And so uh, we, we need to think about that policy. Uh, can government participate in some of the initial infrastructure funding through use of their carbon tax money or whatever? We need to start thinking about the uh, what is the right way to try and get these things moving in BC. And in the case of Quest in Edmonton, we did essentially on, if you look at these three little bars, we did the one on the right where we're putting it right down into the basal Cambrian sand at roughly 2,300 meters deep, and then a bedrock after that. And interestingly enough, because we there was a lot of work done around, you know, people ask, how do you know it's not going to come out? What about leakage? What about surface aquifers? What about, and all of those questions need to be very carefully considered in the subsurface part of the, of, of the project. The, you know, I would say the capital risk for these projects is the capture. It's all the kit and, and and uh, technology you need to capture the CO2, the pots and pans and compressors and aiming units and all that sort of thing. That's where all the capital cost is. 
to drill the well down there is actually a very small capital cost. And we had drilled three wells for Quest, but we actually run the thing on one. And uh, the other two are essentially redundancies. Um, case one plugged off or something, and you want to keep, you know, keep the whole thing running. <clears throat> so I would say the, the uh, capital risk is the facility, and then the technical risk tends to be the subsurface. How do we, how do we know it's going to stay down there? How do we make sure it's going to be down there? And it's interesting, we did a lot of public education around the drilling of these wells and how they're actually sealed and cased. And so um, a deep well for CO2 actually has three different steel casings that are concreted in. And so that you can imagine they would drill down the first 300 meters that all the surface aquifers are roughly in the top 100 meters. And so when they drill the well, they drill the first 300 meters and then they put a steel casing in and then they seal up the outside of that steel casing with concrete. And then they drill again right to the bottom, 2,000 meters, and then they sink another steel casing all the way to the bottom, 2,000 meters, and then they seal that thing in. And then they drill a third one that goes down and then curves at the bottom and goes horizontally. And so what this picture doesn't show is that the well doesn't go <coughs> stop vertically. It, at 2,000 meters, it turns and it goes horizontally, just as we do with all of today's uh, well boring technologies. And so there's actually the injection site. That's why you only need one well, because the injection site goes along through the porous rock that's in the saline, that's in the basal cambrian sand. And so there's a third sleeve uh, or well or steel uh, pipe casing that goes all the way down and turns the corner and goes into it, and it's then concreted in. So that top 100 meters that that everybody's so concerned about water contamination by CO2 actually has triple seal casing through it, throughout it. It's pretty, uh, you know, and I've got another, I didn't bring that chart, but it just sort of popped into my head about all that work that we've done to show the public that those water tables will be protected. CO2 is not coming back up there. Um, I think, uh, that's pretty much for this side. Oh, the pipeline from the facility over to the well site in the end, in the end where we chose the wells was about 80 kilometers. So CO2 pipelines are not something new in North America. There's quite a bit of this, I would say thousands of kilometers of CO2 pipeline, particularly in the U.S. where they've been using CO2 for a long time in enhanced oil recovery. And in those cases, they actually drilled down to find CO2 and then actually produce it out of a formation and then send it over to an oil formation and re-eject it. So that's been going on in the U.S. for, for decades. And so now we're saying, no, we don't want to be pulling CO2 out of the, out of the, out of the deep geology. We want to be putting it in there. And uh, we'll, we'll suck it out of these industrial facilities or out of the air. How many of these projects have we got going on around the world? Well, there's only 19. When, I, when we were doing the Quest project, there was only four. And uh, so we were one of the first projects in the world. Now we're up to uh, uh, 19 just in, uh, in, in the world and uh, 13 in, in, in the Americas. Two in Canada, one is Quest, the other one is um, Boundary Dam in Saskatchewan. I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but it's a coal-fired power plant and they've got a CO2 capture unit on one of those coal-fired units. So not on the entire plant, but on, the, <clears throat> on one. And it's re-injected into the subsurface geology. It's also tied in with an enhanced oil recovery um, program at Waver, Saskatchewan. And then in the United States, we have, they've sort of exploded because of the 10 that are going on in the United States now, eight of them came on in 2018. So uh, there's something going on there we should talk about, and uh, we'll get to that too. But I think what's happened, the U.S. has implemented what they call negative carbon abatement tax incentive. And it says if you can put CO2 underground by any method that's uh, acceptable and technically acceptable and feasible, and show it'll stay there, we're going to give you $40 U.S. per ton. So there's, a, there's an additional incentive to put this stuff on your ground. This is a chart showing these activities starting to 
percolate around the world, the CCS moving from those four that I talked about back in 20, 2006, you know, the, how many things are going on in the world, 19 large scale projects in operation. But you'll see when you get up in Canada, there's two big red balloons. That's the Quest project in Edmonton and the Foundry Dam <coughs> in, uh, in Saskatchewan. And there's one little blue dot there in maybe the northeast corner of BC. <coughs> and I thought Jason might have spoken to that. But <coughs> that is essentially a pilot project that's been going on there since the days of Spectra. And it is around a CO2 cap, carbon capital storage project in the Horn River. And so there was money put forward by the federal government and the province to that activity. And uh, I don't know, we need somebody from Enbridge, I guess, to speak to that, uh, the status of it today. But it's, you know, I think BC looks pretty blank other than that one little dot. I think we need to be putting something on the map here. And especially when you look south of the border and see what they're doing down there. It is an explosion of activity around CCS. And so for all of us that like to sit and ha ha what Mr. Trump's doing and he's not a supporter of climate policy, he's a supporter of making money. And uh, I think uh, this tax incentive for CO2, negative CO2, uh, uh, is, is having an impact. And furthermore, there are other policies that are starting to spill over into the CCS world in the U.S., California, um, and Texas, with their low carbon fuel standard in California, and the ability to use CCS to meet the low carbon fuel standard is also the latest policy change there. Uh, but it's clearly this is the hub. It's it's the U.S. They're they're going to be early movers on this thing, and uh, they've got a lot of activity. On um, and the other thing that goes with these little bubbles is they, they tend to be in clusters. And so that's what this little chart shows about it. It's got numbers one through whatever they are, um, 15 um, or greater. But they, these are all CCS clusters. And so in Alberta, what we built the Quest project in Edmonton, and there is a cluster of activity now forming around Edmonton. There's something called the CO2 trunk line. It's a, it's a CO2 line that's being built between and hence uh, oil, oil, uh, oil formations and those industrial facilities. The Sturgeon upgrader is adding CO2 capture to its facility and enhanced oil recovery uh, activities uh, starting to uh, increase. So they're building a hub around the capture and utilization of CO2 in Alberta, and that's an example of what's happening around the world uh, in these other numbered areas. And then on the right, you can see it can be more than capturing CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. You could be using natural gas, converting that gas to hydrogen, or capturing the CO2 from the hydrogen unit, just as we did at Scotford in Edmonton, and uh, putting that CO2 underground. And now you have clean hydrogen from natural gas which can be used for heat and electricity. Uh, and then the other ideas we're going to get to them is about the use of uh, biomass. So we're going to just take you quickly through the different kinds of technologies. This is the, the one that I've been talking about. You just capture CO2 from an industrial plant. It could be from a pulp and paper mill, a chemical plant, a steam methane reformer, which is something that's making hydrogen, um, and uh, a methanol plant, a um, a natural gas fired power plant, these kinds of things we capture CO2, an LNG, any kind of gas turbine uh, facility which is combusting with natural gas. Uh, capture that on with a back end unit, some kind of a, an aiming unit or some other type of scrubbing, and uh, compress it to 2000 psi and then put it down into these different formations. That's sort of the conventional CCS. CO2 from certain processes is easier and more cost effective. For example, in the case of hydrogen manufacturing, you actually capture the CO2 as an intermediate stream. So you're shifting methane to CO2 and hydrogen. It's a processed gas. It doesn't have nitrogen and, and other mixed 
uh, air components in it, so it's a very concentrated form of CO2 and it's easier to capture. Whereas if you want to capture CO2 from the back end of a combustion turbine, the CO2 is mostly with air and nitrogen, so it's at a very low concentration, less than 10%, and you need a very big facility, really big. It's, it, it goes up at scale times 10 uh, to capture this stuff. So where you're capturing it in your process is also really important uh, as where you're putting it. And this is the point that I talked a little bit about earlier about carbon capture and utilization. Well, why don't we capture this CO2 and make something else out of it and rather than just putting it into the ground? And so these are the types of things that you could do with it. Often it's uh, large scale chemical processing, but you can make, <clears throat> I mentioned methanol can be manufactured using CO2 and hydrogen hydrochloric acid, baking soda, all these other, uh, and bleach, or these industrial chemicals can be manufactured with CO2. So there is a process for using CO2, but the most recent report that I read on this, which was the Global CCS Institute, they released quite a good report in 2018 on carbon capture and utilization. And basically what it said was, Yes, we should do this, but the, but the potential here is only about 10% of what it is just to capture it and put it away into the geological formation. So the big prize is still for putting it into the formation. There's a lot of science and technology to utilize it, but even in the end, there's a limit for those products that are there and how much the world needs of them and uh, the amount of CO2 we have exceeds those products. Uh, needs so uh, it ends up falling short. The CCU ends up only producing about 10% of the sequestration of CO2 that we need in the world. If we were looking at how much CCS is really needed, Rob, a quick question for you, and that, that's using uh, existing processes, right, in terms of the utilization potential. Well, yes, I think that would all be very much conventional technology. So we don't have, assuming no breakthroughs there. Yeah, yeah. good point. Yeah, the next one, and I find it quite interesting. Um, uh, there's two other technologies. The one on the left is called bioenergy with CCS. And that's the idea where you use your harvesting wood or wood products, and you're using the, that, those wood products to produce energy, whether it's electricity or thermal energy or steam. Uh, but then you would capture the CO2 from that process and put it into the subsurface formation. Uh, we have the opportunity to do that in, in BC because we have pulp and paper facilities running and producing fairly concentrated streams of CO2 which are just being vented today. They would be considered net neutral because the trees absorb the CO2 in the first place and then they're being emitted when they combust those same trees. So there's a, it's essentially the, the math is that it's an accelerated version of Mother Nature when we do that but it's still a net zero. If we did put it underground, well, then it would be something different. And then the one on the right is called direct air capture. They call it DAC, direct. And all of these things have acronyms, so you have to kind of learn this whole language. So on the left was the bioenergy with carbon capture storage. We call it VEX, V E C C S. And then on the right is DAX, it's direct air capture. And that's the idea that so why do we have to go to the back of an industrial facility? If that facility is located in Timbuktu and we have a great geological formation right here, why wouldn't we just put a big machine that scrubs CO2 out of the air and right over top of the reservoir and, uh, and then uh, concentrate that CO2 and then inject it into the formation? That's direct air capture. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that one because that technology is emerging in British Columbia right now. And there's a facility running in Squamish, and that is carbon engineering. It started with this concept, which was almost laughable uh, 10 years ago. And now they're getting ready to build the first world scale DAC unit in Texas. Why not in British Columbia, in Texas, for a company that's used basically wants the credits from this kind of an idea, scrub a million tons of CO2 out of the air and put it into the formation. And we get a million tons of credits that we can use against our low carbon fuel standard. 
Um, so that's what's happening down in the state. Oh, yeah, there's just another word on this Vax, the bioenergy CCS. The, I mean, I find it quite fascinating because this one is, this This is a made in BC. This is, this is, there's none of these running in the world today. And I think this is where BC can put its stamp on CCS because we have all these forests. We have a large forestry industry, whether it's pulp and paper. Um, or far forest products harvesting, and they know how to manage those forests uh, to be sustainable. Those products are then going into production, whether it's uh, pulp and paper or, or uh, square timbers, but none of the CO2 is being captured. Now, some of those facilities have those waste woods and are starting to use those waste woods to make energy for the facility, and in which case they can back out BC Hydro or whatever. But if we add CCS onto those facilities, essentially you have energy production with negative carbon because the carbon is being pulled out of the air by the trees. The trees are providing the biomass to make energy and the CO2, it goes underground. It doesn't go back into the atmosphere. So it's actually negative carbon energy, which is you know, almost the whole Holy Grail, but I think it's a it's a unique application, and there's only so much of it because then it becomes a matter of uh, you know forest management and how much biomass you can really use to do this. But it's a, a very interesting application that I think there's a strong case for BC to be having a hard look at. And then there's a couple more uh, CCS technologies, and one is around. I talked about the oceans being in balance that they pull carbon out of the air and then they release carbon uh, through their natural cycle. And so if you actually, just like we move, have those DAC units pulling air through those big uh, exchanger units, if you were pulling water through some kind of a device that removed the CO2, which is again in very minute concentrations in seawater, but you could suck the CO2 out of the seawater and uh, then put it in underground. And uh, I guess this argument is that it would induce more uh, natural CO2 from the atmosphere, but I think that one's a bit of a stretch. Uh, and then the one on the right is uh, enhanced web. These aren't my ideas, by the way. These are just uh, these are scientific uh, blue sky out there on CCS. And then the one on the right is about advanced mineral weathering. So certain minerals have the ability to turn carbon from a gas. To a solid, and so you, could you actually absorb CO2 out of the atmosphere by exposing these minerals on the surface and then uh, um, either landfilling them or doing what you needed to do to uh, sequester it? So, those are some of the, those are all the different technologies. Next slide, please. For CCS, so it's not a one size fits all thing, there's quite a, quite a lot of different ideas around it. Um, and then what about the opportunity of BC? Well, Jason did speak to the idea of capturing CO2, which was essentially formation gas CO2. So when the gas comes out of the ground and we're going to send it to an LNG plant, let's capture it all at one place. Let's keep it in the pipe, number one, and let's capture it all in one place well, before it gets to the LNG facility. And let's capture it in a place where there's a good sequestration zone. So that's what he was talking about. Uh, but I think it's about having all the right ingredients. And so we talk about the geological sequestration. Well, we do have a pretty deep knowledge on our Northeast BC geology. So we have that. Uh, we understand the sedimentary geology up there and the storage space for CO2. That we need to take to the next level, but it's there. Uh, there are, are some other basins which we could also look at get a better understanding of the total CO2 storage in the province. And we also have small scale CO2 and H2S injection ongoing, particularly up in Northeast BC in the Horn River. Some of this is already happening up there in smaller uh, scale. It's not what I would call commercial, full commercial scale CO2 injection. So we've got a lot of stuff. We've got that, the subsurface stuff there. And then in terms of the technical knowledge. Well, we have that pilot up there that's been that was run by spec. We have gas producers in BC that have deep knowledge in this subject. So for example, I work for Shell. Well, Shell's developing these things all around the world. 
And then, of course, they've got one right next door operating in Alberta. Chevron has probably the biggest one operating in Australia offshore. It's called the Gorgon Project. And they're capturing this processed gas, the same stuff that Jason was talking about. And three, three million tons a year of CO2, they're capturing in processed gas and re-injecting it. And there are others that are NBC as developers that have experience in CCS. So all the people that are working in this LNG business in BC have knowledge. Yes. And then we have put in who are the world leaders in direct air capture. Unknown participants now joining. And then the other thing I would say, because I talked a little bit about the effects <coughs> CCS opportunities, they have a mature pulp and paper industry and a, and a mature force and wood products industry, which creates another piece to the puzzle if we wanted to move to that other, that next step around a, a world scale of demonstration for BEX CCS. And then on the right hand side of this slide, I talk about some of the other, you know, when you get CCS, you have to start thinking about, well, where does it make sense to do it first? And, and it's about the, the location, it's also about the cost and the technology you have to deploy. So maybe it's, you know, the piece that Jason talked about was brought as gas, but that's a fairly small number. If I look at, let's go down the list here. The first one is pulp and paper at 8.3 million tons per year. Well, I think that's more than pulp and paper. That's all forest products as well. Um, but it's, it's a big amount of CO2. And right now that CO2 is all reported to British Columbia, um, and BC uh, CAS and documented, but it's not when we talk about BC has 65 million tons per year of CO2 uh, emitted, that number is not included. And that's because that 8 million will say, well, it came, the trees absorbed the 8.3 million and then it was released when we manufactured the wood and did the pulp and paper. So it's a net zero. So that 8.3 million is not in our balance which means it's an opportunity if we captured, you know, some of it or half of it or whatever we could and put it down, that's, that's negative carbon. That's ore that comes off the books. It's gone out of the atmosphere. The second line item is the gas plants. And this is what Jason was talking about, um, <clears throat> capturing the CO2 from the formation gas. So that would only be a portion of this. Some of this is our gas plant, gas turbines running to compress natural gas and whatnot. So, uh, and then the third one, there's refineries and cement plants are another source, but again, it depends on where they are. Those things are sprinkled all over the province. It's not helpful if you're trying to build a hub. Uh, new LNG facilities, well, we know the facilities are <coughs> right on the coast, but we don't have the deep geological formation. And uh, so that makes uh, a bit of a challenge. And then the new upstream gas facilities, we don't know how they look. Some may not be fully electrified and there may be other opportunities there. So, and then we keep going down the list. I say, what about a new bioenergy facility where we <clears throat> make some energy from uh, bio products that then capture the CO2 or hydrogen from methane and capture the CO2. So I don't know, these are other potential sources and uh, of CO2 for trying to create a hub. And then the last one was direct air capture. Well, let's just forget about all these facilities. Why don't we just capture it out of the air, suck it out of the air, and put that thing right over top of the best reservoir we got in the province. So these are ideas, and this this whole thing has to be kind of, it's, it's not like we need to look at, oh, where's that LNG plant? How are we going to capture that CO2? It's like, we need to look at where this stuff is all across the province and where it makes sense to do the CCS hub. How are we doing there, Rob, in terms of time? We're just two two slides left. Okay. And, and I think this this one is my uh, this is the blue sky thing. This is the dare to dream Arnold slide. <laughs> um, yeah. So I just blue sky out here. What could happen in BC? Well, let's say you had a pulp and paper plant, 1.5 million tons. I could I would pin that one right in Prince George. There's a very large facility there already uh, removing their CO2. It's just about doing something with it. Gas plants, well, we have them in the horn that are venting the CO2 today. So if we could capture that uh, or just do something with that and then direct air capture, there's three 
three projects that total 3.5 million tons of CO2 right there. And then it's a question of where you put it. Where's the right location for that sequestration? And then it's about having the right incentives and uh, path forward. And so what's needed? And so I think the first thing is a vision for BC, for a BC industrial CCS hub. You can't leave this to one any one developer. Um, I think there's a, there's a, you need a few cooks. And uh, in the case of, for example, a Bax CCS project, the pulp and paper guys might know how to sequester with wood, but they don't know anything about subsurface and see even CO2 capture technology. So again, that's the moving to the oil, the oil and gas sector has all of that technology. Um, and then um, working with the government. So there's, there's a whole idea, you need to bring these people together, we need a vision first. And then the second thing is, this stuff is expensive. I talked about $120 per ton per quest, and that might even be one of the cheaper ones, but there, there is cheaper. And there's more expensive, so there's, there's probably a range of that, that price, um, but it is uncompetitive when we're looking at other CO2 abatement because if we look at forestry uh, CO2 abatement, it's going to likely be less than thirty dollars per ton, and maybe Jamie can speak to this uh, shortly. But uh, we're going to need some help if we want this CCS initiative to get off the ground. Probably some funding for infrastructure. Could we use carbon tax money for that? or future carbon tax money, money that is committed to other programs, and uh, incentives for negative CO2 abatement. It seems to be having an impact in the U.S. We need to be thinking about that here, and then developing policy in support of CCS. So it's one thing to build a DAC unit and put CO2 away, but you need to be able to move that CO2 credit from that particular developer to the buyer. So it's about having a market and trading. And then you need all this regulatory regime to make sure, particularly around making sure it stays in the ground and it's got monitoring, measurement, and verification, all the rules for what we call environmental integrity. So anyways, that's it. That's my overview on CCS. Sorry, uh, I took maybe more than the time that I was allotted. Um, Rob, i um, very excited about your presentation. Um, you mentioned something about Squamish and that it was a pilot project. I just did some research on Google on that. and. It says that um, Bill Gates, the guru of Microsoft, was part of their financiers. It being a pilot project, did you hear anything else new on them? Or are they going to make it work? Scrubbing the air of CO2 and using the, what's left over for aviation fuel and the project of theirs? Yeah, yeah, great question. I, was, I had the opportunity to go out to their site. Um, just uh, just before Christmas, I went out and had a site tour and met with some of the staff. Uh, this pilot's been running for uh, more than five years now. It was started by the guy, uh, David Keith, with the brainchild behind it, but they've received some financing along the way, including the Bill Gates Foundation. And this technology is proven. And now what's happening is they have their first commercial contract. So initially the idea was to scrub CO2 out of the air with these <coughs> big fans, concentrate it, and then make it into a uh, fuel. So, but when you make it into a fuel, you and I know when we burn it, it's gonna go back into the atmosphere. So, but what they have done by doing that is, is they've created a carbon neutral fuel. So you make fuel with CO2 out of the atmosphere, but when you burn the fuel, that CO2 ends up back in the atmosphere. But that was their initial product and, and idea, and that was because they need a revenue stream. And it's, well, this stuff costs a lot of money to pull CO2 out of the air. And so what's going to pay for it? Well, the fuel's going to pay for it. So that was the idea. Their first concept was uh, um, fuels from CO2. And they need, they need quite a bit of energy to make that fuel, and so the idea was they would get that energy from renewable electricity, so it would be carbon zero energy to help them make the fuel. So that was their initial concept, but their big project to build the one million ton per year CO2 is in Texas, and it's for uh, Occidental Petroleum, and they are basically saying, 
we need a million tons of CO2 credits for our low carbon fuel standard <coughs> in California. And now the rules over the U.S. allow us to use carbon capture and storage. We want you to build that air unit right over top of that formation over there, suck the CO2 out of the air, and put it underground. And that's going to create a million tons of CO2 credits, which we can use against our um, against our uh, low carbon fuel standard requirements. Uh, low carbon fuel standard credits tend to be in the two to three hundred dollars per ton range. They're quite expensive, and so all of a sudden. If this stuff costs 150 bucks, you know, it, it starts to make economic sense when it's used for low carbon fuel standards. So, so that, that's another area of interest for BC if you've got these low carbon fuel standards, but, but we can't do that here, and yet they can do it in the States. We can't use this technology, which is here in BC, in Squamish. They're going to build the first one in the U.S. in Texas. It's, it's a bit of a shame, but it's it's good for them. Uh, the company's growing quickly. There's, uh, you should go and have a look at it. It's uh, pretty uh, world, you know, it's, it's groundbreaking stuff. CH4, so we can turn methane to hydrogen and we can grab the carbon and store it in a hydrogen fuel. So why are we producing LNG when we can do that? Is that less, uh, is there less yeah. return? So yeah, I think, as much? yeah, it's it's two two reasons. I would say there's I think it's it's we often think of it as the future, Alex. It's the next evolution. Um, because number one, the metallurgy for for hydrogen is more sophisticated. So all the infrastructure, often when you're building a I've built a hydrogen pipeline before, because when we did the project in Edmonton, we also built a hydrogen link to a neighboring plant. But you need a you need upgraded metallurgy for those pipes, and uh, the second thing is well, hydrogen is difficult to store and move. So if you're putting it into if you want to move it around for transport fuels, for example, you've got to put it into truck tanker trucks. It's at high pressure, and so it's got a lot of energy you know, stored up in it, and so uh, it's it's inherently dangerous that way. So it's, it is about overcoming those hurdles of storing and moving the stuff around. Uh, we've got to, and then building out the infrastructure, a whole suite of hydrogen fueling stations. Why don't we have hydrogen fueling stations, for example, all around? But then you need to get the hydrogen to those hydrogen fueling stations. And so all that infrastructure is yet to come. But, uh, and there's not a market there yet for it. So you know, we build all this hydrogen, nobody's, everybody's still burning coal for crying out loud. It's an evolution, right? They're burning coal, they'll move from coal to gas, and then gas to maybe renewables and hydrogen as the future, uh, as the uh, as we go to this uh, energy transition. But it's going to take time. So if we were building on hydrogen now, we'd be, we'd be decades ahead of the curve, and uh, we might not have any buyers. Okay. How come... In Texas, for 40 bucks a ton, they can get eight plants built, and it costs uh, $120 a ton here. Uh, that's a good question, but I think, I know that, that they're all being built in Texas. I know that this latest one is Texas, the DAC unit. Right, yeah, I don't know where it is. Yeah, the others, the others, they've got the $40 per ton incentive, and then I think it has to do, uh, and then low carbon fuel standard. But I think there are other incentives in the state, like a statewide. So it could be government money, could be states with a variety of incentives that start to make this stuff happen. And, and it could also be enhanced oil recovery, which yeah. means they're capturing the CO2 and they're going to use it to produce oil, and pushing wrong. more oil out. And I think that starts to pay the freight. Stuff. So I think that's what's happening down there. It's a combination of things, but I bet enhanced oil recovery is probably the top driver. Secondary drivers are policy and net negative carbon emissions. Yeah, and this is Linda, I agree. I think it's a combination of the subsidy with the market for enhanced oil recovery. But it's interesting that um, that this subsidy has come through under the Trump administration, Rob, you're right. Um, 
uh, you know, and it, it, it does parallel. If you look at it, you know, the subsidies and incentives that came out for renewables first in Germany and then in the U.S., you know, you can, you can definitely see some parallels here. So it's a big, uh, I think it's been a big factor in the growth in the U.S. and will continue to be. The industry is lobbying hard for even more, I think. I would also suggest it's probably 15 years of a lot of money. 